Uh, okay, everyone, it is time to get started. Today's uh, going to be an important episode of this webinar series where we're going to go over um, the one table research. And we have with us Mark and we, who are the architects of that research, and they're going to tell us a whole lot of stuff that we need to know as an industry. Uh, where some other webinars will sometimes talk about topics that cover um, the entire world of food, both food service and retail. Today's session is really, really focused heavily on food service only because, um, again, we're looking at the one table research, which is all about food service and specifically what it means with the current landscape of challenges that operators face and what you as suppliers to the industry could be doing about that if you want to thrive in 2022, 2023, and beyond. Uh, before we get started, just a reminder. Uh, this whole thing works because of the amazing community of active voices that you all are. So hit that chat button. And again, I think you might have different versions of Zoom. I have no idea what it even shows you anymore, but there should be an option to chat to all panelists and attendees, or it might say everyone. Which other option you have, choose that. Don't just choose panelists, because that means only the three of us could see it. We want everyone to see um, uh, your thoughts and words. So hit chat right now, all panelists and attendees, or everyone. And maybe to get us going, this is actually a little bit of a social experiment. Uh, what's for dinner tonight? And if you don't know, just say, I don't know. I haven't thought that far ahead. If you think, you know, if you know you're going out to a restaurant, but you don't know which one it is or what you're going to get, say that. If, uh, if you know you're cooking at home, but you haven't figured out your recipe yet, say that. If you know exactly what you're making or exactly what you're having, say that. And again, if you have no idea at all, just say, I have no idea. I'm actually curious to know, because I don't think we've ever actually done research like this, which is, um, you know, you often ask people questions of what they think they might do in the future. Like, hey, do you plan on spending more, spending less? You often ask questions about what their behavior has been in the past, what their attitudes are. You don't often ask questions like, hey, what are your plans in five hours? Uh, because that's probably a fairly accurate reflection of where they are in, the, in their thinking at that moment. So I'd be curious to see. Uh, for me, I have no idea. Mark? Probably frozen pizza from Costco. That's very specific. OK, we? Um, I'm having dandan -dan noodles today. You're getting dandan -dan noodles? Yeah, yeah. I got a bunch of ground pork that I need to use up, so it's like the perfect way. Oh, you're making that. That's, that's really impressive. OK, well, um, everyone, just uh, let us know. What are we seeing in chat? So, uh, very healthy, very healthy. And do most people have specific plans already, or is most people saying, I don't know? No, a lot of everybody's got plans, yeah. Or I guess the people who don't know might not be responding. The right? people who don't know no, responded first, but I don't, I don't know. know. Because that's actually part of what we're trying to learn here is do a lot of people just not have any idea. So I, I'll say I have no idea what's going to happen for dinner. I don't know if it's going to be inside the house or outside the house, at a restaurant, at home, or skipped entirely. I truly have no idea. I'm uh, living on the edge, I guess. Okay. <laughs> a lot of leftovers. A lot of leftovers. A lot of leftovers. Okay, so a couple things to keep in mind. Many of you know that we have this awesome service called Flavor, which looks at pretty much anything you could eat, drink, you know, and, uh, you know, thousands of different foods, flavors, ingredients, healthy methods, you name it. Uh, and for each, there's, you know, we, we help you understand, you can look any of these things up. Uh, do people know what that item is? Do they love it? Do they hate it? Do they fall somewhere in between? Have they had it before? Do they have it often? And I want to show you some of the things that we learned when we looked at this information demographically, which I just think is sort of interesting. There are some types of items that certainly skew towards certain audiences. So this is one of the pages in our flavor service. I think many of you already use a service now, which is wonderful. And you can see uh, something like boba, for instance, right? It's If you look down over here, we're looking at um, the affinity score. So it's like, do people love or like boba? And you can see it's way higher, as you might expect, among Gen Zers than it is with boomers. And there's actually a number of foods like this. And one thing we see with Gen Z, a lot of times it's like more fun, unique, you know, Instagram-y type of things. You get like big, big spikes with Gen Z and much less so with an audience like boomers. Now, on the other hand, you have some things that move in the opposite direction, right? Something like marmalade, for instance, um, is actually substantially more interesting to boomers than a Gen Z, like a 68 among boomers in terms of loving or liking it versus just a 44 
with Gen Z. So things do move in both directions. And I don't know, how often do you hear of marmalade um, these days? You can actually see in our SNAP service that marmalade, having been you know, relatively flat or grown for a while, it really sort of became a little bit less popular in the immediate wake of the pandemic. And it's actually dropped in penetration on restaurant menus, but it's far more common in fine dining. Nearly 9% of fine dining restaurants offer marmalade. So even though let's say the general public and let's say the younger audience that we have now, you know, Gen Zers aren't as crazy about marmalade just yet. You know who does love marmalade? Especially on you, the form of a sandwich. It would be our friend Paddington. Paddington loves marmalade sandwiches. And you have, if you have not yet watched the Paddington movies, this whole segue was designed just to remind you to do exactly just that. I like the second one more than the first one, but you can watch him in whatever order you please. So if any of you have now seen Paddington, whether it was before or after the, these recommendations, share that with all your colleagues on chat. It is so fantastic. It'll warm your heart. It'll make you want to be a better person and the world becomes a slightly better place each time someone else watches. Hey, Jack, Jack yes. can you see the chat? Can you yeah. see the comments? I, I can't see them. They, okay. Everybody saw this coming from a, a mile away. You're kidding me. Yes. No. Um, but, but I just wanted to share specifically from, uh, from Stacey Gallagher, who said she finally watched both and she agrees with you totally. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like uh, we're, we're making a positive change in the world. We're getting something done. Good deal. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I thought I could bury that segue in there and surprise everybody, but I guess it doesn't work that well. You're all too smart for me. Um, okay, so we have some great new content in Report Pro, uh, a wonderful new report on economic indicators, what's happening. These are all very, very current from just the last week or so. Um, we have a great report on climatary and eating. Make sure you check that one out if you have your Report Pro subscription handy. And we have a number of new segment guides that go over each of the segments in food service. Here's one for K through 12, but we have them for all the other segments as well. And it tells you what's in the minds of operators today, both in the current landscape and more generally for their business. So if you have a segment specific strategy for your company, you should definitely check these out. Uh, but today's topic is really about these three issues in particular, the current challenges faced by operators and what it means for suppliers to be in a street relative to labor shortages, um, supply chain disruptions, and what has been rampant inflation for a while now. Uh, and the way that we're covering this is through an initiative that we call One Table. So let's talk about what One Table is real quick. Many of you are actually participating members of One Table, and um, we thought it would have been really helpful to put together sort of a consortium of companies that you know came in uh, and just offered up ideas and what were the biggest challenges they saw in their current environment today. It keeps, keeps going forward automatically relative to these three topics, inflation, supply chain, and labor shortages. Uh, over 100 companies participated. Data Central picked up the entire tab for all of this. And ooh, that's annoying. Um, and we're sharing the results for free to the industry because we want to help. You know, I remember a while back we did a poll and we asked people like, hey, What's a bigger issue or bigger challenge? Is it the, the COVID itself with all the closures and everything or the aftermath of COVID with supply chain, labor, and inflation? And everyone said it was the aftermath. So we thought it was important to offer in research absolutely for free to the industry because we want to support you um, just as you've supported us. And that's what this One Table initiative is all about. Uh, Mark and we are the actual architects of that research. They're here with us today to share these findings. Uh, and one table culminates in a pretty awesome report in addition to this webinar. And that report will be available today at the end of this webinar on Report Pro. So if you have um, Report Pro, and many of you do, I think actually most of you do, and you know how to access it and everything, and you've created, you know, you, you have your Snap account and you've been there before, great. You can log in at the end of this uh, session and you can download that report. Uh, but some of you might not. So I'm going to put up a, a poll. And the question is, do you need our help to, um, oh boy, why do they have choice? Ignore choice four, choice five. That's really annoying that it did that. Uh, do you need our help in getting you set up with Report Pro so you can download this report? So if, uh, if you don't need our help, you don't even have to fill this out. 
But if you're not quite sure how to get into Report Pro, um, just click yes, and someone will follow up with you and we'll make sure you get a copy of the one table report, uh, plus access to some of the other stuff in Report Pro as well. So I'll leave this up for like 20, 30 seconds. You know, they changed the polling feature in Zoom, and I think they auto filled choice two, three, four, five. I figured the software was smart enough to realize that if you didn't remove the word choice four and choice five, that that wouldn't actually be a choice to show, but I think they didn't quite figure that part out. So we'll see. So I think we have one more poll and we'll probably have choice three, four, five again. Now we have had a very small handful of people that are uh, smart Alex, some very small handful, like five or six that selected choice four and choice five in this poll. So, uh, okay. <laughs> I guess if I can do the Paddington thing, they can do that. All right, let's give it five more seconds. Again, click yes only if you need help. If you don't need help, no big deal. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And again, for those of you that have Report Pro access, just go there at the end of the session and you can download the report today. All right. So this is the structure of the report that you'll find in Report Pro for one table. There's basically three sections. The first is on the state of the operator. What are they thinking? You know, how are they doing economically? The second is what's happening with the products and they're purchasing their behavior, you know, how they're sourcing, what are they buying? Are they switching different types of products or formats? And the third section is the road ahead, which is, you know, what do they have planned in the future? What is their future intent? Are they planning on increasing or decreasing their menu and in which areas? And how do they plan on taking on some of these new challenges? And what do they plan on doing about all of that? So three simple sections, and we've decided to structure today's webinar um, along these three sections as well. So let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we have one more quick poll. Uh, so this is actually an image that was generated by Dolly, the thing that we saw when we started. And this is what happens when you type in pandas voting. And here's a question for you. So of the three issues below, which one is cited by a majority of operators as their biggest current challenge? Is it labor, supply chain, or general inflation? Or is it none of these? Because none of these is a majority, is uh, one's a majority of the vote that it's not, none of these is much bigger than any of the other, th uh, any of the other two, right? Is it labor is by far the biggest, supply chain by far the biggest, general inflation by far the biggest, or is none of these much larger than the other two? Uh, Everybody so in the chat is saying labor. You're, you're guessing labor? Everybody in the chat is. That's the chat. Oh, that's interesting. So we're, uh, the research we're going to look at is basically fielded with operators. I think there's 800 operators across all segments, decision makers. Um, these are people that are uh, actively making decisions on which suppliers to use and which products to buy. Uh, they're often uh, GMs, owners, um, executive chefs, food service directors, those types of folks. And uh, let's see what they had to say. So I'm gonna close the poll right now. This is really interesting voting. You voted here, you're right. The majority of you picked labor, saying that labor got a majority of the vote from these three things. Uh, some of you said supply chain, some of you said general inflation, um, and only 7% said, you know, none of these is actually that much bigger than the other two. So uh, let's see. Let's see if you're right. So you guessed labor on average. So let's take a look. The greatest operator challenge, inflation, 38% of operators said of these three things, general inflation is the biggest challenge of the three. 30% said supply chain disruption and 33% said labor. It's basically a third, a third a third. The right answer is actually the, the one that we least predicted in our poll just now, which was D, none of the above. None of these is much bigger than the other two. But I think what you start learning when you look at the data a little bit more carefully and closely is you can't really um, think of these as distinct things. Operators sort of regard this as a general like soup of stuff where supply chain disruption, labor shortages, and inflation all just sort of interacting with one another. And this is what the soup sort of ends up looking like in the end. It's like a little bit of everything because 
they don't really care about, let's say, the underlying force itself. They care about the way it's manifesting in their business. And the way that that stuff manifests is sometimes directed by multiple of these generalized forces all at once. So uh, we were surprised to learn this as well. But what I think is really interesting is it doesn't matter which type of operator you're talking about, whether it's a QSR or a hotel or a, or a CNU or a K-12 operator, still pretty close to a, a one-third, one-third, one-third split across the board. You know, I think labor was probably a pretty good educated guess because for the longest time, year after year, when you ask operators what's the biggest challenge in operation, they would say it's attracting and retaining labor. Uh, but now with these other things that have also come into play, it really is just sort of a generalized soup of things that's making life really, really difficult for the operator. Okay, I thought this was sort of interesting too. We asked operators as well, uh, what do your margins sort of look like, right? So after you take out like you know, your key expenses, food costs, labor costs, some of your overhead. So pre-COVID, right, when we asked, when we asked, you know, what were your margins look like before COVID happened? Uh, the average we saw was about 21%. And you can see how this breaks out by segment. Um, what do you think it looks like today? If the if operators are talking about their margins today, do they think it's better or worse than the pre-COVID number? Uh, what are people guessing? Everybody's saying worse. Yeah. And not just, so you're right, not just worse, but substantially worse, right? An eight an eight percent drop versus pre-COVID, which on a relative basis, it's like a forty percent decline. And uh, I don't know. The next time you eat out at a restaurant, just you know, talk to the owner or the manager for a second. They actually love talking about this stuff because misery loves company, and they'll tell you just how painful the current environment is for them, and why you know even though they wish they could pass along all their costs and whatnot, they're just it's really hard to do because they're scared. To, to pull the trigger on those major increases to customers. So with that, we wanted to maybe start with a look at inflation. And here's, um, I thought, an interesting stat. So if you go beyond like the, just the generalized soup of you know, just general inflation, um, and you start asking like, hey, what specifically is the biggest pressing challenge? Yeah, general inflation is about as challenging as labor is, you know, let's say, or product shortages are, you know, but, Rising food cost in specific, in particular, not just generalized inflation across the entire economy, you know, the price of used cars and whatnot, but rising food cost to the operator is crazy. And it's also really unpredictable, right? I was just at a sandwich shop uh, for lunch today, you know, and, and he said, and many of you know, the, the owner there was talking about some of the things that I think we all know, which is, you know, beef is up 60 or 70%, even for my cold cuts. And you know, this last week, all of a sudden, out of the blue, it was turkey. Turkey just increased like thirty percent in a week or something. And you never really know what's going to be that next item where you see a giant spike. Um, it's it is wreaking a good deal of havoc with many operators today. And look at what operators have said has happened to them in just the past six months. So this is from their perspective. We asked, hey, how much have your costs gone up in certain key areas? In just the past six months, they said packaging on average is up 18%. Our food costs are up a massive 17%. Our labor is up 12% in just the last six months. That's a huge, huge increase. Now, of course, this is response data from a survey, and someone might overstate something, someone might understate something. But the general direction and intensity of these numbers is really, really quite significant. And it's leading to that margin compression that we saw earlier on, where we went from 21% margins to 13% margins. And one of the things that you know we at Data Essential said on this webinar series, in the first couple of weeks of COVID, all the way back then is, you know what, you're probably going to see something where in the short and intermediate term, depending on how long COVID runs for, I don't think any of us thought it was going to run this long, um, <laughs> depending on how long it runs for, Operators are going to be really focused on top line, you know, in that short term, just getting more people back in the door and making sure they have some revenue. But you're going to see a violent transition from their thinking from top line thinking to bottom line thinking. And at some point, making profit and profit margins is going to matter to them more. And we think that transition uh, not only has started to happen, but has largely already happened. So having sort of a bottom line mindset and how you communicate with the operator, right? You can talk about 
you can talk about you know how you can help them attract more customers. That's great, but you need to filter that and distill that story down into, and this is how it's going to make you more money in the end. This we're going to help your margins this way. This product requires less labor, so it's going to save you more. Their margins are crushed. They need to bring that up, or sometimes it's just not worth staying in business. Um, and if you look at this, this is that same number, but we broke out here by segment, right? This is how much do you think that your prices have changed in these major categories, fat packaging, food, and labor in the past six months. You see some some ups and downs, and I think like, you know, in B&I, for instance, and C&U and K through 12, you probably have a little bit of an exception when it comes to, to labor. But for the most part, the numbers are double digits for each one of these three things across the board, across all segments. So the, the, the increases to the operating cost of the operator is quite real. Um, and the question is, how long can they hang on for before they have to really either charge more to their customers or find ways to cut some of their costs? So we wanted to sort of tackle that first part of that question first, which is, uh, can operators pass along costs to the customer? Right? Can they raise the price on the menu? Uh, and we can know this in really great detail because uh, this year we took our Menu Trends product and we started updating the data on a quarterly basis. So you can get you know, even uh, more timely information. And one of the nice things about doing that is in this highly inflationary period, we can look at price data uh, and we can get a pretty recent look at what's happened with pricing. So I'm gonna look at the quarter uh, of data collection that takes us through um, April 2022. So a few months ago. At, so if you go back to April, that's like three, four months ago, right? At that point, general inflation was at 8.3% year over year. Um, you know, we hit a high of 9.1 after that. We're back down to 8.5 in the latest report. But in April, it was 8.3% year over year. Um, food at home inflation, prices at the grocery store, um, ending April was up about 11%. So the question is, if general inflation for that 12-month period was 8.3 and prices at the grocery store was up 11%, um, how much were prices on the menu up during that same period of time? Will it look closer to that 11%? because that's probably pretty reflective of the prices that an operator might pay for their food is gonna be higher than that because we saw even higher levels of reported food cost increases to the operator. Um, is it gonna be closer to the 8.3% and track with you know, general CPI? What do you think? What, what, do you, what do we replace those question marks with? Um, any guesses? How much did menu prices on average go up during the same period of time that we see for the, the two pink boxes here? Uh, what type of guesses are we, are we seeing? Either the chat has read the report or are, are they're very, very good at predicting many price inflation because a lot of people are in the right ballpark. A lot of people are saying between 5 to 7%. That's pretty impressive. Or, 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 you know, uh, or we've actually helped make people smarter, which is the, the whole point of, of this <laughs> webinar series. So yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, so you are all very, very smart at this because I think most people would say, oh, it's going to be really high. But the number is actually 5.6%. So think about that. The cost of the operator, whether it's for food or labor or some of the other stuff, packaging and the other things that they need have gone up double digits and then some. But over that same period of time, their many prices only went up 5%, right? It's no, no, uh, there's no doubt why their margins are crushed. Um, they're afraid to pass along a lot of these prices their customers. Um, so that's just the reality they live in right now. And I think they are going to have to find ways to get that number up their margin, which probably means raising many prices or finding ways to save on some of the stuff that they buy. And we ask, which categories are currently showing the greatest level of inflation? I think you probably all know this instinctively. If you had to pick a category of food that an operator buys or, or, or let's say disposables or packaging or, or food category, where do they, where have they seen the highest degree of inflation that concerns them? Uh, well, we're going to animate this. Come on, can we get any guesses in as this is oh, animated? Chat, chat's amazing. Chat's saying broken and meat. Yeah, they, they all got it. <laughs> someone said baby food, which is fair, yeah. <laughs> That's fair too, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is meat by a long shot. Uh, I mean, it's not even close. Now, that just could be partially because 
uh, how much money is spent on protein in a, in a restaurant um, and that it's a more expensive item overall, but still it's like double the vote of anything else. And we'll, we've uh, been I tracking this... during, during you know, the, the year with other operator research, uh, people are mostly saying it's been uh, beef, uh, chicken, and chicken wings. Yep. Um, yeah, we saw that early on, right? Chicken wings were crazy for a while. And I uh, actually wanted to show this, right? It's like a, there's, it's like a local pizza place. They changed their chicken wings to market price. Market price. It's crazy. I don't think that's a great way of selling chicken wings because I don't know, would, would you even, I'd be almost embarrassed to ask them how much the chicken wings are, right? right? But, but, yeah. you know, but the guy's like, hey, it, the changes so much from week to week, I have no idea what price to put on my menu. So I had to make it market for a while. Or look at this place. This is actually a, a barbecue place. that's like a mile from my house. They're like, you know what? The prices change so much to on, on us all the time that uh, we can't even bother printing up a new menu. So you should just assume that none of the prices on our menu are correct. And if you really want to know how much something costs, please ask us and we'll let you know at the, at the time that you order. That's amazing. Uh, so this is the environment that we have currently. Uh, hey, look, actually, this is an interesting poll question. So look, general CPI hit 9.1%, right, two months ago. This last report we got down to 8.5, so it looks like we've had um, a little bit of a decline and the July numbers didn't increase much from, uh, from, from June. Food, food, though, actually continue to go up. Uh, but I want to ask you a question about general CPI. So if this most recent report was at 8.5 for July, uh, will the August numbers, which comes out in, I don't know, three weeks or something, um, will they be higher or lower than 8.5? Like, no one knows, right? But this is, uh, I'm curious what, what people would guess. Have we hit a high already and we're on our way down? Or do, you, do we think it might spike once more? So will August be above or below the July number for headline CPI? What are people guessing? I'm actually just curious, I have no idea. It's a mixed bag for now, but a lot of people are saying either lower or flat. Yeah, I, my, my sense is that number will go low, but uh, food uh, might be a different story, we'll see. Okay, so what are you gonna do as an operator if your food costs continue to rise over the next six months? So they've already gone up a lot, what do you do if they keep going up? Well, now many are saying, you know what, I'm going to be at a point where I have to raise the prices across my entire menu. Keep in mind, restaurants don't normally do this, right? They, they normally will rise, raise the price on batches of items at a time, maybe like two times a year, four times a year, or one time a year, they'll make some sort of adjustment. It's pretty rare that they'll actually just say, you know, I'm going to take every single item on the menu and increase the prices there. It can not do that sort of more targeted batch price increase. So the fact that we're seeing like almost half of, of operators saying that this is going to be something I'm going to have to do if things don't cool down in a big way, um, lets you know that we might see a big spike in menu prices across the board in the coming period. So uh, we'll have to monitor that. And look in the middle too. I mean, a quarter of them are going to, are, are saying they're going to think about uh, reducing portion size. So the, the threat of shrinkflation, it, it's out there. It's, it's, it's more than zero. Yeah, for sure. So this is an interesting thing. We're going to transition to labor for, for a second. So here are um, different types of, I don't know, positions you might have in a, a restaurant or other food service establishment. Which one of these very specific things, I, you, okay, if you want to make a general guess, you could say front of house, back of house, or management. Or if you want to make a really specific guess, you could say, you know, server slash bartender, one of those things in white. Which of these do operators report as being the most understaffed area of their business right now? Is it general managers? Is it hosts and greeters? Is it barbacks and food runners? Where do they say they're most understaffed currently? We've laughed. So, sorry, chat said, uh, if we count the types of things that are being mentioned from chat, everything is being, it, it is significantly understaffed. Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's a pretty good split, I think, between front of house and back of house for now. Is there is there a number one vote or anything? Uh, for every for every back of house or line cook, there's another person saying server. All right, well, let's take a look. So, who's most understaffed? There you go, right there. It is um, prep cooks, line cooks, you know, back of house cooks. Uh, no question, number one, like by far, more than any other 
position, right? General managers, yeah, they're probably pretty good, right? That's six and 13%. That's not bad, right? So the, the dark, you know, the darker part of the line is significantly understaffed. The light pink line or salmon line is slightly understaffed. But you have like nearly 80% um, of operators say they're short staffed when it comes to their back of house cooks. So think about what that means. I mean, one, you have a lot of positions across the board that are short staffed right now. But if you're talking about people that can actually cook, that have some basic level of cooking skill, and that's what the restaurant or operator is missing, like what does that say about the types of products that they might want to use um, to get through this time? You know, does it mean that they're going to want to use stuff that's I don't know, really involved and requires a lot of culinary skill? Or do they need simpler stuff that maybe a, a less staffed back of house team can, uh, can work with? And I think this is something that we see pretty consistently in the data is a movement right now because of these three specific things, labor supply and inflation, and in particular here, um, labor shortages, that operators want simpler, more convenience-based product formats. Maybe that's not their ideal. Maybe they like the idea of making everything from scratch, but they just can't right now in a lot of cases. So speed scratch and other convenience formats will mean quite a lot there. So we, I mean, you can see that in the numbers here, right? Um, what, do you, did any of this surprise you, the percentages? Um, yeah, I mean, I was uh, personally, when I was working on this report, I was expecting that more people are gonna to transition to pre-made products instead of like keeping on with their current like level of food prep. But like, it makes sense that like fewer people are gonna be engaging in, in scratch preparation, yeah. especially in this environment, right? Yeah, so, so this is where context is always helpful. Um, so you can look at this number and say, yeah, it looks like, you know, 17% wanna go more towards pre-made and 9% wanna go more scratch and most wanna stay the same. That's fine. But I will, let me tell you what these numbers normally look like when we don't have a labor shortage and supply chain disruptions and all these other things going on. Typically, you get a much higher, we would love to, or we'd love to, where we would plan a transition towards scratch. This is an aspirational thing, right? If you ask operators in normal times, like, hey, what do you, what do you plan on doing in the future? More will say, we plan on moving to scratch because, you know, they think they can get there. Oftentimes they don't actually, but it's aspirational for them. Mm -hmm. That number has dialed back substantially in this environment. So I, I think that 9% is an aspirational number still, yeah. probably still a bit overstated because it's aspirational. Um, and the percentage of operators normally that ever says, hey, we think we're gonna use more pre-made stuff in the future is minuscule and it's jumped up substantially. So, I mean, it's, have that in the back of your mind as context, but there's a real appetite to move towards more convenience oriented product formats because of the environment that we're in, right? Like due to this, this is a quote, due to the supply chain situation, we had to start buying more pre-made foods, which actually cost us a little bit more than just making it ourselves. So um, this is not just related to, to, to labor, but it's also supply chain. We had to go to pre-made stuff, even though we would have preferred using scratch product uh, and and we would even save money if we did scratch. We had to go toward pre-made. And they may have had to find different sources for those too. I mean, that if you don't normally buy pre-made things or or convenience products from your normal distributors, they probably had to start looking at different sources too. Yeah, that is true. So uh, we asked operators if they could predict the future a little bit here. So here is uh, a dolly prompt, black pug wearing a chef hat, looking into a magical crystal ball cinematic photo. This is what it gave us. It's a pretty cool picture, I think. Uh, but we really wanted to understand what operators think is going to happen in the future. And here's the question. Which of these three things, general inflation, labor shortages, and supply chain, are operators least optimistic about going forward? So which one do they least, are they least likely to think is going to improve in the months ahead? Uh, yeah, what do you all think? Leader out of the gate, yeah. What's that? Labor is the leader out of the gate here on this one. Labor is. So let's see. I think uh, I think we have a counterintuitive result here. So uh, a lot of people think the labor situation will improve. A lot of people think the supply chain in, uh, situation will improve. But operators, and remember, this is fielded in July. This is fielded very recently. So this is not like an, an old, old world perspective. This is just a few weeks ago. Uh, 
they're more, they're much less uh, optimistic about inflation. 53% think it's going to get worse, right? Only 15% think their food costs and other parts of inflation are going to get better. Uh, whereas they're, they tend to be a little bit more optimistic about labor and the supply chain situation. Now, I think it's actually quite possible that labor does start getting better. I mean, if uh, like no one, no one has a perfect crystal ball, but if we are in something like a recession and, and layoffs and that type of thing starts happening, your labor supply is going to start to improve. And I think you're already starting to see signs of people coming back and taking, you know, some of these types of jobs, whereas previously maybe they didn't want to do these types of jobs. I'm going to go to my local grocery store and you see, um, you know, you probably see like some older people and stuff working at the checkout counter all of a sudden. So you might have people being forced back into the labor force because uh, inflation is making it hard to make ends meet without taking on a second job or uh, a first, you know, or an only job for someone that was already retired in some cases. So uh, I don't know. I think operators might actually be onto something over here. Uh, Jack, the inflation think, thing. Jack, do you think that, that wage pressure might have something to do with that too? I mean, because I, I think that we have seen some food service wages wages come up. Yep. And I'm wondering if we're kind of getting to that equilibrium point where the the supply and the demand are going to meet a little bit better. I think so. Yeah. I mean, you know, wages went up quite a bit for these types of jobs, right, uh, in the restaurant industry and, and whatnot. Uh, but I mean, you saw from the previous number, I mean, understaffing is just so incredibly rampant. I do think a lot of operators have learned to adapt to some of that. And I think others have started to find automation as solutions, probably mostly in chains first. But uh, I think the question is, will we ever see a return to full pre-COVID employment in food service? If you look at employment recovery, many other industries are, you know, have basically come back, right? Like they're back to Co, you know, pre-COVID levels of employment. Um, food and hospitality is the one sector of the economy where we're still down, I think, you know, what, million, million and a half jobs, something mm -hmm. like that. It was a substantial number. Uh, okay, let's move to our next section. This is on the products that operators buy and how they're buying them. Uh, we, uh, you want to talk to us about what's happening with supply? Uh, yeah, we, we asked them a lot of questions about how they're dealing with supply chain disruptions in the past how, uh, six months at least. And this question is very intriguing. Like at least basically 96% of operators are saying that out of stocks these days are happening if as much or more often than before. That means they're getting a call from distributors and suppliers that are saying that like the products that you want are just not available at the rate and the time that you want it. Um, and when we ask them uh, for, you know, like just a free response to like talk about the struggles that they're facing, um, frequently operators are mentioning like having trouble reaching uh, distributors, having trouble getting the things that they want, having to change the menus because the products that they were previously relying on are no longer available or available at the rate or the time that they wanted it. And so- And, and sometimes you won't know until like the day, the day you're expecting yep. a delivery, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, and the, the other phenomenon that that'll often happen is you order one product and then a slightly different product shows up. Right. Which has happened. It, you know, it's gone on forever. But now this, the notion of distributor substitutions is much more frequent than it has been before. So actually, we I just wanted to maybe introduce one thought over here, which is we want to understand from operators like, hey, OK, so we get it. You're having more products um, substituted now. You ordered this brand and, and this flavor or you know, this cut, and you got something slightly different. Can you, can you work with that? Or is, is it just, you know, is it a deal breaker? Is it something that's, you know, you, you can sort of work with, but is like super annoying and inconvenient? Or is it something that doesn't really matter? You can, you know, you can work with it and it's just fine. You can see what the distributions look like over here. Uh, about a third say, we're fine with a substitution. We can work around it. 60% say it's really an inconvenience for it. It's not going to kill us but it really sucks when that happens and we'd like to resolve this. And then 6% smaller number says this instant deal breaker if our product changes. And you might think, hey, 6%, that's not so bad. Substitution's okay. It's at 59% in the middle that I think is the real concern. There's a whole lot of operators that are getting a lot of substituted product that are saying, this is not great. And if it continues to happen, we probably have to find some other solution at some point. I mean, we, I don't know, I don't know what your experience is with this, but what are your observations here? 
Um, so like I mentioned before, I think a lot of these insights we can probably get from our open ends, which was obvious, honestly, like probably the most insightful open end question that I've worked with during my short career as a researcher. Um, but I think there are two issues here, right? Number one is the actual like substitution itself that can be inconveniencing. But a lot of what people are pointing out issues with communication. Um, for example, like it's, you know, it's an inconvenience if our preferred brands or products are not available when we want it. But if it's a substitution that's happening the day off or the day before, that's really inconveniencing the operator to have to make last minute changes. I'd imagine that like, you know, if they get a notice of substitution, like say a couple of days before or a week before, maybe they can have time to prepare, but communication issues are really, really what's sort of standing between um, operators and, and, and distributors. Because I think our operators understand that it's a tough time for everybody in the street. So they're genuinely more lenient if things like this happen, but they also need time to prepare, right? And so that's, I think, what's happening here. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, thank you for that. Uh, what are we seeing with other places that operators might be buying products from? Uh, yeah, so, oh, the cat. Uh, I, I did not re realize. Uh, yeah, so um, because of that, um, operators are now becoming a lot more flexible with where they're buying and sourcing items. Um, they're relying on a lot more alternative channels um, rather than like, you know, their uh, direct manufacturers, broadline distributors. So you can see like um, figures for club stores and third party websites go up like 40, around 40% 40 are saying that they're relying on those sources more often than they used to be in the past. So um, in this, you know, in this operated environment, um, and as you can see from the next slide too, Jack, if you can go to that one. So I want to point out two things here. Number oh, one, sorry, go for it. Yes, yes. Um, we challenged uh, me to see if Dolly could create a picture of his cat dressed <laughs> as a restaurant owner ordering products online. And this is what the AI created. So that's why that picture is there. The, the second thing is the question that you see here is what are you using more often or less often than you normally do because of supply chain issues or labor issues or inflation or what's happening in the current environment? And the thing I would notice this is not to say that broadline distributors are losing a big chunk of share. Now, the vast majority of food service volume still moves through broadliners. And if you really broke things down into how much volume each channel commands, the broadline number hasn't drifted very much, even through COVID. But what you are seeing is a lot of times operators just running out of stuff. Like, oh boy, I thought I was going to get this in my, in my delivery, but it didn't show up. Now I have to go to the club store or I have to order something online real quick, you know, from a third party website like Amazon and try to get it right away. And if you're a supplier to the industry, think about this, like normally your product is being delivered and re-delivered week after week after week after week. It's a thing that the operator relies on. You're basically a locked in basket purchase that's automatic. But if your product isn't available all of a sudden and the operator has to sample another brand because that's just what's available at the club store, you know, maybe they end up liking that other brand or that other product where it's a little bit less expensive or it works nearly just as good or something. You might actually lose a long-term customer in that case. So this is something to really think about. You shouldn't just look at the incremental changes in volume in the short run, but what might it do to the lifetime business that you have with that operator customer um, because of all the switching that's happening? Right. Uh, we, what do we see here? I mean, to the point that you just mentioned, right? Like in the past six months, and we're still talking short term here, but who knows what's gonna happen with relationships. But when we're talking about supplier operator relationships, you're seeing a lot of operators switching up where they're um, sourcing and, and switching up how they're sourcing. So you're getting like nearly a quarter of operators buying new brands from existing suppliers or buying from new suppliers entirely. Um, you're also seeing uh, a quarter of operators starting to dual source products um, and like a smaller percentage, like switching or adding new distributors to the mix. So, you know, whatever tight relationships, you know, operators had um, prior to this current operated environment, you know, might be a little challenge um, if, you know, they can't get what they want um, in the same way. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. And the image suggests that like the, the operator's pattern of conduct has been disrupted. They're, they've veered off course because of these forces and it's creating all sorts of um, downstream effects. Uh, Mark, what are we seeing in terms of how operators are shifting, uh, you know, their, their product purchases? Well, it's not just how they buy; it's it's what they're buying too. You know, they're they're making a lot of different decisions, um, category by category, um, kind of across their their the basket of goods that they have to buy. And so, um, 
what we've seen so far initially, this is just the past uh, six months, is the, the shift is occurring more toward uh, value tier products than toward the premium end. And I think that that's probably, uh, you know, we mentioned before that uh, when folks are talking about convenience products, it actually can cost them a little bit more sometimes. But then if you are looking at kind of, uh, you know, similar preparations, but then the difference is, is in the brand, uh, more often than not, operators are kind of leaning toward the value end than they are toward the, the mid tier or up all the way to the premium end. Yeah, and we're actually sort of seeing this on the retail and consumer side too, where private label purchases are coming back in vogue again, but it's certainly happening with food service as well. Mm -hmm. And brands, I mean, I, I think there's a point here, um, which is you just told us, Mark, and absolutely right, that operators are starting to switch towards value and to some extent mid-tier products. Uh, but this, is, this doesn't mean that brands aren't important or valuable anymore. Quite the opposite, actually. Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, th there is a there is a, a rise in private label brands, so it's it's uh, it's definitely something to, to contend with. But um, at the same time, brand matters. Uh, you know, as much as ever. Um, and so, different manufacturer brands can position themselves. Uh, you know, to sort of really pick up some incremental business, depending on uh, you know how they can be marketed to consumers and to the operator. Yeah, and we should remember, I think sometimes we shortcut and think, oh, um, you know, manufactured brand is expensive and private label is cheap. That's not necessarily true in food service because you have tiers of distributor exclusive or private label brands, right? You have, you know, um, Cisco Reliance and you have Cisco Imperial and you have, you mm -hmm. know, other distributors that have, you know, lower tier brands and other private label brands that are much higher quality tiers and more expensive as well. So th that's not mutually exclusive from, um, you know, the type of brand and whether it's uh, and its premium level, right? You you could have a more expensive distributor brand or a less expensive manufacturer brand. That's right. It's it's so stratified that um, it's a lot of incremental effort, but you could end up uh, you know maintaining your cost levels or or even saving some money if you put in that work. Um, but for the most part, too, they they are uh, operators are looking for a kind of versatility, not just you know in their ability to shop around for different brands, but they are. Uh, you know, tending to also, if they can, you know, purchase uh, smaller case sizes, smaller pack sizes, they're, they're more likely to ask to, you know, break a case here and there where they can, and if, if they can work with their distributor that way. Um, but for the most part, I mean, the, the pressure is on them to, uh, you know, sort of shrink their inventory levels more than grow them. And in order to do that, uh, they're asking for kind of different sizes of what they buy. And it tends to be on the smaller side than the larger side. Mm -hmm. I thought this was really interesting. What do we see here, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it, this makes a lot of sense given the uh, difficulties people are having in labor, especially in having a fully staffed back of the house. So if you are able to, if you're unable rather to have enough people or enough people with enough experience uh, in the back of the house to kind of do your normal amount of scratch prep, um, that does put, you know, more of a premium on things like, uh, you know, frozen or flash frozen products or, uh, you know, fully prepared, um, you know, sometimes par baked or, um, you know, pre sliced pre cut produce, uh, things like that, just because we have fewer people to, to execute in the back of the house, we have less time to train them. Um, and, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of turnover too. So the easier that we can make things in the back of the house for the people that we have, um, the, the better. We're going to see a probably more growth in community products there too. And it, and it changes what people, what people are looking for too, where, you know, now, uh, you know, the, the more sort of versatile a product can be in terms of, I can put this in several things across my menu, um, you know, and, and that comes back to things like the, um, you know, pre-cut produce or, or flash frozen produce, uh, things like that. The, the more mileage I can get out of you know, every category I buy from, uh, the, the better, because that's necessary right now. Yeah, and also I think even look at this, just general formats, right? Shelf stable, frozen, <laughs> fully prepared on balance, becoming, you know, more appealing. Fully scratched is like, you know, not really moving as much in that same direction. It's really the convenience products is where the market is shifting. Mm -hmm. And that takes us to our last section, which is, you know, what are operators think about the future and what are their plans? Um, we, uh, what do we see in terms of where they plan on growing their menu? 
Yeah, so when we're asking operators to, to select the type of menu categories that they're likely to focus their innovation efforts on, um, most operators are basically going to focus on sort of, you know, the big ticket items, sandwiches, pizza, uh, center of the plate proteins, um, things that are filling sort of like center of the meal items, um, which makes a lot more sense because I think those are categories that sort of like not them the highest like ticket prices and also are what consumers probably want the most when they're when they're visiting a restaurant. So um, do these numbers surprise you at all, Jack? No, uh, not, not particularly. And mm -hmm. I, I think look, they're going to focus on core stuff first. So a lot of yeah. times that means things like their entrees. I think the, the the word of caution to the industry is there's going to be just like, I think like human nature is going to lead us to say, oh, you know what, uh, because people are trying to cut back or something, or they're trying to find ways to save, um, they may not focus as much on new ideas. That's actually not, well, one, that may not be true. Two, it's also a really bad idea to to do that, right? We We don't want this to be a race to the bottom, in which case, pretty much everybody loses. Uh, it's innovation and interesting foods that keeps people coming to restaurants and other places. Otherwise, you just eat at home, right? The one advantage restaurants and food service have over uh, retail foods is people like them more because they're more appealing and you can get stuff that you can't normally get from home. To do that, we need innovation, right? Because uh, eventually the frozen aisle at the store catches up with the stuff that you have you know, on a restaurant menu. So we have to keep that buffer and stay ahead of the game. So it certainly doesn't surprise me that entrees is where the focus is right now, but I don't think we should forget about the other categories. You know, to me, this just means you're going to have more natural activity in these categories, but you should probably work a little bit harder in some of these other categories to make sure you keep those ahead of the curve too. We don't want to be eating the exact same soups for the next 10 years. <laughs> we, what do we have here? Yeah, a very similar story here. Um, we're asking operators to sort of select like which of these three types of menu items are you going to be focusing on for again culinary culinary innovation? And you know, similar to the last slide, a lot of like over half of operators are going to be focusing a lot of their R&D efforts on you know core menu items. Um, a significant chunk are also looking at you know innovating on value items and promotions. But I think something that's like you know heartening to me is that like the focus isn't just directed to like entirely on value, right? Um, uh, I, I appreciate that operators are, you know, choosing to stick with their guns and focusing on the things that they're good at instead of like, you know, jumping to just find whatever's cheapest and sort of like focus their innovation efforts there. So I think that's sort of the takeaway here. Yeah, and I think language is going to be a more important factor going forward, right? There's so much that, you know, we've done and I'd like psychologists have looked at in terms of how do you describe products or how do you describe a menu item to make it as appealing as possible? You know, how do you take, you know, regular bacon and make it sound like really fancy bacon somehow? Um, a lot of menus and particularly, you know, independent restaurants that haven't really, you know, don't have access to this type of information directly, they haven't optimized the language on their menus yet. So you as suppliers to the industry can offer them that guidance or in the context of your product, Give them ways of describing it on the menu so you can defend the higher price points they're going to have to charge uh, at some point to, to their consumer uh, patrons. Uh, so I think helping them with menu uh, language optimization is probably something we all can do, you all can do, um, and it's not going to be, you know, an expensive thing to do. It's, it's, you know, just, it's just messaging, but it's important messaging. Uh, Mark, what do we have here? Well, I think that my my prior point stands here too, which is um, th so these are the attributes that operators are going to look for, um, you know, in the products that they buy, uh, and a lot of it has to go back to how this interacts with, with the labor shortage. So, uh, you know, more than half of them are saying that if you can save me some labor, um, you know, whether that's with a convenience product or with uh, something that can be made, you know, in in batches and then versatilely used across the menu. That's going to be uh, kind of the, the biggest feature that people are looking for in in what they're buying, but it really all comes back to having to do more with less and with fewer people. Um, I think that you know all the way on the right side of that chart, a lot of these uh, you know kind of quality descriptors that you know I think probably mattered uh, a little bit more uh, in in pre-COVID times where differentiation was a matter of of quality and prep style. Um, it's a kind of a luxury we don't really have right now. So those are going to be de-emphasized. Yeah. And right now, what's really most important 
is uh, how things can be uh, made more efficient in the back of the house um, and uh, you know amenable to a, a short staff. Yeah, I think Mark said it well. I mean, all, every number on this slide is important, but if you really want to boil it down, you can ignore everything other than the first two. Like that's your entire story right there. And that's basically your strategy in, in broad strokes for, for your product category. Show that your product is labor saving. And if it's not, make it so and show its versatility and how it can be used in lots of different applications. That's your winning. If, if you have lemons, now you have labor saving lemons. You know, like that is quite literally the thing to do. It's what a majority of operators want right now. Uh, so this is uh, how operators want to be contacted for like, if you have a new product you want to tell them about or deliver a sales message. Uh, Mark challenged me to see if the AI could create a picture of his dog um, looking at email. And this is what it created. Uh, what type of dog is this again? Uh, a Bernadoodle, half Bernie's mountain dog, yeah. half poodle. The AI could actually make a picture of a Bernadoodle, which I didn't even know was a thing, um, looking at its laptop, reading email. And here you have it. But uh, that is the number one thing that the number one way operators want to be contacted, right? Mark, is email. Yeah, I mean, email is quick, it's convenient, um, and it's it's sort of a low touch thing, right? Um, people still value the in-person visit because we'll see later that the the advice and the assistance you can get from a DSR is still incredibly important. Um, but you know, just you can't you can't beat email or text messaging for how quick it is uh, when we're trying to solve problems on the fly here. Yeah. Um, and, and down there, you know, at the, at the bottom uh, where it says, I prefer not to be contacted. That's just folks saying, look, I'll call, I'll contact you when I, when I need help. Don't, don't bother me. But it's a small number still. Um, and one, one last couple of things, and we're, we're going to wrap up here. Mm -hmm. Which information sources have become more important in this current challenging environment to operators? DSRs are still high up there. I think sometimes we forget about the value of the DSR and how much influence they wield. Now they, they, tend to be more important to restaurants than to on-site segments. Mm -hmm. And in, within restaurants, they tend to be most important to full service restaurants. But overall across all types of operators, they're still number one on this list. So you know, this is something I think I, we often see in the industry, like yeah, suppliers don't have great DSR support programs. It's something to really think about. Uh, when operators have a lot of need, that DSR, if they use one, is going to be that first call they make oftentimes um, to figure out what the heck is going on. And you want to make sure that your product is slotted in that person's memory as something that can help them um, in this environment. Uh, okay, just one last quote. And we're going to wrap things up. Hey, you know, I'm an operator. I just want to tell everyone that's a supplier, be prepared with substitutes and offer compelling and value-oriented products. Give me suggestions for increasing my profitability and some areas that we may have overlooked. So they want ideas as well too. You know, and then do some, help me analyze things, help me understand my menu prices compared to the you know, menu prices around me and what that means for my business. If you do that for me, uh, you'll have a customer for life. Um, as of this minute, I believe, I don't know how good our timer works, but um, the report should now be available, uh, one table in Report Pro. So if you're in SNAP and you click in Report Pro, uh, hopefully, maybe someone can confirm this, you should be able to see the one table report just about now. And if you said yes to that poll earlier, uh, we'll follow up with you and show you how to get in and, and get this report too. I think it's 50 some odd pages, it's great. Take it and share it with your colleagues across the industry, share it internally with all of your you know, food service teammates at your company. Uh, if you wanna understand what operators are thinking, this report goes into greater detail than we were able to cover in the webinar today, but we think it's gonna be really, really helpful as you plan for 2023 and beyond. On our next webinar in two weeks, which I think is, what is that? Is that September 1st, it's two Thursdays from now, whatever day that is, we're gonna go over our 2023 industry numbers forecast. So we do this great piece of work with IFMA, which is a wonderful organization. Probably almost all of you are IFMA members. Uh, and they published the industry numbers that we helped them prepare, but we're going to go even a little bit deeper than that in a couple of weeks and talk about segment by segment, what are the headwinds, what are the tailwinds, what do we expect to see, what do we think inflation is going to look like next year, and what do we think it's going to mean for the total size of the food service industry. Thank you all again. Uh, we, yeah, I, I promised myself that we wouldn't go over, but we went over by a minute. I guess it's not the end of the world. Uh, if you're not working with Data Central already, you can email us at hello at datacentral.com. Otherwise, 
just, uh, I guess, reach out to your Data Central team member and we'd be really, really happy to help you with anything that you need.